Our scripture reading today is from the New Testament, the book of John, and it's the red letter words when Jesus is talking. So it's an extra honor to read these. Um, and the title, I feel like we had some like harbingers of what was coming. The Good Shepherd and His Sheep is the subtitle. So I'll start um, at verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This is the word of the Lord. I don't need to repeat that, do I? Mary okay, K Mary, Kay Ma Turner. Mary Kay Turner. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mary Kay started an organization called the Holy Land Christian Society over 20 years ago, and I feel very honored to serve with her on that. And she will be introducing Mitri. There was a small gathering of us last night, and I'm taking her line, but Mary Kay said, isn't it amazing and wonderful that a Catholic can introduce a Lutheran in the Presbyterian church? <laughs> and that, to me, is what church is all about. It's about all of us, one, all together. I also felt touched this morning by that line in one of the songs we sang about how God can kick down walls. Mitri comes from Bethlehem, and as many of you know, it's surrounded by a wall. And our prayer is that wall is going to come down someday. We know that. Mary Kay will introduce Mitri. I'll come over there. <laughs> I can just hold it this way. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for my being here. I, that wall is 30 feet high and twice as long as the Berlin Wall. And do you remember how we all felt about the Berlin Wall? Well, this wall holds in and captures the Christian community in Bethlehem. And when I first went over there, I had, first of all, I had a student who said, Mrs. Turner, everybody's forgotten about the Christian Palestinians. That's where Christ was born. We are the living stones of Christ's apostles. And we're only 1.3% left, as Mitri's going to tell you, in a place where the largest religion in the world was founded. And so I became involved, and I thank Corinne so much for working almost daily on trying to help the Christians there. But it is my deepest honor to introduce to you someone who is probably the most dedicated, heartfelt Christian leaders in Palestine. His home is in Bethlehem. 
When he came back from getting his PhD from Germany, he headed up the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem as its pastor, and there were six people in the pew. And he thought, what have I started? What have I left in Germany to come here and do? From that humble beginning, and because he was such a caring, dedicated pastor to the Christians in the Holy Land, he founded a cultural center that included music, art, film, making for many of the people of Bethlehem, mostly Muslims, 70% Muslims. And if there's ever a reason for us Christians to be ministering to people of other faiths, this is a great example of letting the Muslims know how much they are respected and how peace is a better choice than violence. He is now the president of Dar al Kalima University in Bethlehem, one of the finest institutions, I'm saying, in all of the Holy Land. He also has a full church where he used to be the pastor, and all of you watch it on Christmas Eve when you watch the, the celebration of the Nativity in Bethlehem. So for someone who is dedicated, a leader throughout the world, having written over 40 books and speaking many languages, it is an honor to have someone like him speak to you now about the living stones in Bethlehem and what maybe all of us can do to help keep that place what it was meant to be when Christ the Shepherd came. So, Dr. Mitri Raheb, Reverend Mitri Raheb, would you please come? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, great to be with you this morning here um, at the Presbyterian Church. Um, actually, I came all the way from Bethlehem to see Ben. <laughs> now he's not here, I'm here. Uh, but we wish him well. I know he's watching us right now. And uh, we miss you, Ben, and we pray for you. And uh, hope to see you uh, soon in Bethlehem. Uh, and I feel so much connected, actually, to this church because uh, I, I heard that the seed of this church was put back in 1995. That's the same year that we gathered at the crypt of the church in Bethlehem and we felt the call to reach out and this is how our actual ministry started. So we started almost the same time uh, and then I heard this... Uh, you know, sanctuary was built 2002, 2003. That's the same time, uh, actually, our auditorium was built, which looks very much like that. So I guess uh, God was working at the same time in Bethlehem and in Jackson uh, Hall uh, with very similar visions. Uh, and uh, this is why I feel here at home and great to be here. Um, I guess for many of you, maybe this is the first time to meet uh, a Palestinian, Arab, Christian, Lutheran pastor, uh, who also served with a Presbyterian as mission partner in residence. Uh, I know it sounds like a contradiction, right, in itself, and people uh, often don't know that we exist. Uh, I still have groups coming from the States uh, to visit us, and then the first question always they have on their mind, uh, tell us, when did you convert to Christianity? You know, their assumption is maybe we used to be Muslims or heathens who were converted to Christianity by some missionaries from the Midwest or so. <laughs> right? Um, and I like to remind people that uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Palestine, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Sorry for the people <laughs> in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, and um, actually, uh, you know, the Bible, believe it or not, did not originate in the Bible Belt. Thanks God, imagine, right? 
uh, I mean, the Bible really is a product of Palestine. It came out of that land, right? Uh, where I come from. And so uh, I was born literally across the street from where Jesus was born. I mean, literally. And so when people ask me, when did you convert? I like to tell them, you know, most probably, most probably, one of my grand, 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 grandmas used to babysit for Jesus. <laughs> so we have that long story with Jesus. And actually, our forefathers and foremothers were the one to bring the gospel all over the world. But as you heard uh, from Mary Key, unfortunately, the Christian community in Palestine is dwindling. Because we have been living through oppression one generation after the other, and it's really not easy to live in that kind of context, surrounded by walls, um, with no room to grow, uh, with no hope for the future, no uh, political horizon, and so many Christians feel, why bother, so they leave. But we are not leaving because we think it will be a shame, actually, if Christianity uh, will cease to exist where it's all started, right? Uh, and this is why we are committed to staying there. Now, if you come on a Sunday to worship at our church, you will see we worship in Arabic. And this is sometimes a shock for people because in this country, people, when they hear the word Arab, they think it equals Muslim, right? But not all Arabs are Muslims because actually Arab Christianity is older than Islam. Guess when the gospel was first proclaimed in Arabic? Some people think 19th century, 18th century. If you read the Bible, you come to the story of Pentecost. You know that story when the Holy Spirit came down on the disciples, and they started speaking in tongues. You know that story, right? And so you read it, and so the first disciples started speaking in Danish and Finnish and Norwegian and German. At least this is what Lutherans like to think, right? <laughs> None of these languages is mentioned there, but Arabic is one of the languages mentioned in Acts 2, verse 13. So imagine, 2,000 years ago already, the gospel was proclaimed in Arabic, before Islam, long time before Islam. And for us, it's important, actually, to keep preaching the good news in this language, in the Arabic language. Now, we heard the gospel about the good shepherds. And this is actually a Palestinian story, the Good Shepherds. I know you have also here in Wyoming many shepherds, maybe different kinds of shepherds, but let me take you to Palestine to understand actually a bit better this gospel, which actually is a very challenging gospel. I guess, you know, we really, we were a bit spoiled as Christians uh, because the image of the handsome good shepherd, you know? The nice looking guy with the blonde hair and blue eyes who is standing there in nice garments um, and he looked like one of the Hollywood stars. That's, I think, our image of the good shepherd. I have to disappoint you. <laughs> That's not the Palestinian shepherd. In fact, a few years ago, uh, we had one student who is a Bedouin, a real Palestinian shepherd, a Muslim actually. He came to our university and registered to uh, uh, learn a contemporary art. And uh, I had him over coffee and said, uh, Rafat is his name. I told him, Rafat, tell me, what does a life of a shepherd look like? It wasn't like this image at all. He told me, you know, when I go with my sheep, sometimes I'm 40 days in the desert alone with the sheep. Now imagine 40 days without a shower. <laughs> this is why in Palestine, people looked at shepherds being stinky. You don't want to be around them <laughs> necessarily. 
but also it's it's a tough rough life you know to be all these days alone without real food uh, loneliness you don't meet maybe anyone you are just stuck with the sheep so I learned actually it's a totally different story the good shepherds than what we used to know from all of these nice images but it is really this passionate shepherds that does all of this because of the sheep so 40 days in the desert alone no showers doing all of these kinds of things just because he wants the sheep to have life and to have it abundantly that's the life of a shepherd in Palestine and actually in these words Jesus was criticizing the political leaders of his time who are hired hands I think they are said in the text uh, think of how many political leaders actually have destroyed their countries you know thinking of Ukraine now you know a country that is being destroyed by political leaders right they come to steal and to bring death not life uh, Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly because he cares for us so that's the first uh, the first critique to that image but then there is another challenge in this in this text when Jesus talks about the sheep that hear the voice of the shepherds like they know his voice they recognize his voice and I feel sometimes I'm not sure how you feel but I feel in this world it's so difficult nowadays to listen to the voice of Christ because we are so many voices around us that are telling us so many things and we cannot anymore know what is truth and what is lie you know we live in, in a kind of a fake news uh, age right I mean sometimes I sit in Bethlehem and you know I switch uh, TV channels and I look at uh, I listen to Fox News uh, for an hour and then I switch to CNN one hour and you think I mean <laughs> where is the truth <laughs> right two different stories they have nothing to do with each other uh, and then if I want to listen to what's happening in the Ukraine and I, I turn to RT, the Russian channel, and then I turn to the German channel, where is the truth? It's very scary actually that we don't know anymore where the truth is because we are all the time actually, you know, uh, hearing all of these different voices and the truth is lost. And you know, as Palestinian, I know that because when I come to this country, I, I notice that the people in this country don't know much about Palestine. They don't know our story because all of the time they hear the Israeli version of the story. Not because they are bad people, because this is what you get in the news. Uh, so Jesus actually is, is challenging us to listen to his voice which will help us find the truth and not to be distracted by all of these different noises around us that actually are spreading so much fake news and the third challenge in this text is when Jesus talks about I have sheep in a different pen that I have to bring you know and this is a challenge because sometimes we think we own God right uh, sometimes we think you know I and my tribe are going to be the only one to be saved you know I, sometimes I meet these you know uh, groups and they think in heaven there will be only 60 people it's their tribe everyone else is going to hell imagine this morning I was introduced by a Catholic friend in a Presbyterian church and she was introducing a Lutheran pastor, right? 500 years ago, this would not have been possible. 
people think these two or three sheep, they don't belong together. No, God is bigger than what we think. Thanks God, because otherwise it will be boring if, it will be, if we will be stuck with our tribe. Isn't it great that today I'm standing here as a Palestinian in the U.S., you know, two different continents, two different cultures, two different languages, two different pens, and then still the same Lord and the same shepherds. I think this is what is so exciting about Christianity. This is why it's never so boring because it's always bigger than what we think. And so I think what is so, in this, in this gospel, what is so uh, encouraging is that often we go astray, as in one of the songs we heard it, right? We go lost. We, 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 we believe in the fake news here or there. Uh, we are misled by politicians, by church leaders, by our own thinking, and yet he doesn't let us just be there. He, he leaves the 99 to look for us. Um, and he doesn't rest until he finds us. Um, thanks God that we have such a shepherd that will never leave us even if we go astray, even if we are lost, he makes sure to find us. Amen. Prayer with you. Okay. you. As they come to lead us in our closing song, I wonder if we could just have a prayer with, with you and um, just kind of thinking about maybe some of the challenges you face as you return to Bethlehem. And is there maybe one or two uh, challenges or concerns that, no, I'm putting you on the spot, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we'd love to be able to pray for you. Um, I mean, you know, praying for the young people in Palestine who cannot see hope, uh, who might believe in life after death, but they cannot find life before death that is worth living, that they know that Jesus came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Mm -hmm. I think this is... I like that. Um, in the in-between hour, he spoke a little bit about uh, some, of the, some of the books that he's written. Um, if we want to learn a little bit more about the Palestinian situation and some of the kind of theology that you've put together uh, about this, your books are available to us. They are available online. on Amazon online. You can get them in one day, you know. Uh, and yeah, if you look me up in, in Amazon, you will find all of them. Oh, terrific. Yeah. And they are in English, not Arabic, so don't worry. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I, you know, ben, if you're watching, we missed you. Uh, I know Mitri missed you. And uh, can we pray for you and, and for the, the young people of Palestine? Lord our God, we give you thanks for this your servants, this shepherd of your people in Palestine. We ask your, your blessing upon him and his journey here in the States and as he returns home, watch over his family. We do pray for the young people in Palestine as they grow, that they might come to know you, that they might understand that your love, your grace is for them, that they too are the children of God. Thank you for this time that we can worship to be made more and more aware of the vastness of your creation of your people around the globe. Lord, lead us each into ways of service, of purpose, that we might fulfill your mission in the world today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for thank being you. with us. I assume you'll be out and available here over the next few minutes so we might chat Definitely. with you. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you.
Let's stand as we sing our song of blessing. that special music of Psalm 23. And what a great benediction that is for all of us today, how that ends. That surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now, be with you forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.